Okay, should we go? Good morning, everybody. Hello. 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 Hi. Does this work? Yes. Yes, it does. It's amazing. Okay, we, we, we are the, the odd presentation out, which is why there's only nine of you here. Um, we're going to be talking about IOS and a few tips and tricks on how to sort of stay within the open source type of community when you're building IOS apps. This presentation is partially a bit of a rant about open source licensing, followed by a bit of a list of tips and tricks on how to be a good open source type citizen in the Mac and iPhone developer community, followed by... And we're going to tell you how to be tools. Then we're going to tell you how to be tools, yeah. Um, that's basically a summary. We'll kind of jump randomly between different topics uh, as we go. That's just the way we work. Why is that not keeping up with that? It's showing a completely different thing. That's weird. Thanks. Don't like your computer, Chris. Thanks, Ken. Okay, this is who we are. That's me. And the other one's Chris. Mind if I just restart this presentation and see what happens? Our presenter screen has like started lagging. It's really weird. Right, that looks better. Kinda. Cool. So. Okay, and that's Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. And unfortunately, well, we're not going to be bothered telling you about ourselves because you probably all know us anyway. There's so few of you. Um. Okay. Unfortunately, the iPhone and Mac developer community has a bit of a reputation as being a closed environment that's sort of unwelcome to anything resembling open source or anything with a beard. Um, so hopefully you can come to learn that's not quite the case, although you do have a fairly tight box or tight space in which you must play. Um, before we go on, we're not lawyers. Please don't sue us if we tell you to use a license that turns out to be a terrible idea. If we were lawyers, we'd look like this man. And yeah, clearly he wears a hat, which means he doesn't look like a lawyer. Exactly. Mm. Uh, there will be far too many pictures of William Shatner in this presentation. OK, as I said, um, jump back 40 years. Okay. Uh, as I said, you, you need to turn no further than GitHub, which is a really popular sort of community code hosting site, to observe that iOS has a really vibrant open source community around it. Just type iPhone in, type iOS in, type iPad in, and you'll see hundreds of thousands of projects come up. That, you should need no more proof than that. If you really want to use something else, you can go and look at SourceForge or whatever happens to still exist. They all have the same thing. They've all got thousands of great iPhone projects in them. Great frameworks, all sorts of things you can use. So that's great, but why would you want to do that? Uh, there's generally three reasons why you might want to participate or partake of the open source community. They are as follows. You could be insane. You could be an open source freedom loving hippie. Or you could just be a nice person. Um, sometimes I get those around the wrong way. Sorry. But in general, you usually fit into one of those camps. Wait, no, that's not right either. Oh, I may have got them around the wrong way still. Try it again. Really? Yeah. Yeah, much better. Really? Mm. You think so? Okay. So, generally you'll fit into one of these camps. Usually it's a combination of all three. In the case of Chris, it's definitely, he's insane. In the case of me, it's because I like all three of these camps. You don't you love do freedom. I love freedom. Really? Yeah. Freedom. Oi. Hey. Um, so why should you do this? Uh, well, the, so the open source community is a really social beast. Uh, it's all about sharing, it's all about talking, it's all about caring, it's all about sharing pieces of code that make obscure things work. It's all about talking about undocumented but not private pieces of APIs. Does this sound familiar to anyone? It's just like the iPhone community. Uh, we really exist in the same sort of community. Okay, the first thing we're going to be talking about is free and open source and how the fruit company sees it. Uh, this is a description of free software as taken from Apple's Terms of Service for the iTunes store. These are technically under NEA, but if you Google it, you can find it. So don't sue me. I don't think Apple here, but that's fine. Okay, so this is what Apple defines free and open source as. Basically means anything that is distributed under one of these licenses, but could be another license. Pretty simple. It's a pretty standard definition. They're not trying to trick anyone here. This is what section 3.3.2.0, 2 I think, or 2.0 says about open source software in app store distributions. It says that if it contains any free open source software, uh, then you must comply with the license. This is also not particularly sinister. Does anyone think that's sinister? No, it's pretty reasonable. Uh, you must also not cause Apple's software to become obliged to comply with open source regulations by using it with Apple software. That's also fairly reasonable. Hello, Tony. So basically, comply with your free open source license and 
don't expose Apple to whatever you're doing. Apple doesn't like being put near people with beards. Very simple. What, what you mean you should do what you're asked to do? You should do exactly what you're asked to do. That makes sense. It does. Why, why, it's amazing. Why? Oh. So yeah, Apple has actually been quite clear in this case. Is anyone familiar with this? That's a witch's hat. A witch's hat. But it also means something else. Can somebody tell me? Does anyone know what happened with VLC? Maybe it was we late, late last year? Yeah, we have an informed audience so far. This seems pretty good. Good. They're better, than the, keep on asking, They're better should, than the open source. Group. Yeah, we should keep on asking them questions. I agree. I agree. That way they can do the talk for us. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, does anyone remember what happened with this? Was it late last year or early this year? Yeah, late last year. Mm. Anyone? Yeah. It was a bit of a shitstorm. Can I say shitstorm, Tony? You just did. Oh, well. Now it's Thanks. on the recording. We'll have to beep it later. Okay, thank you. Um, a company called Applidium, which is not affiliated with the VideoLand project. The VideoLand project is a long standing. Is it a company? I guess no, it's, it's, it's an open a source company. project. Yeah, They're okay. French. We don't know what they are. French. Okay. Um, they made a product called VLC. It's been around for many years. It's a pretty decent video player for a variety of platforms. It's got lots of codecs wrapped up inside it that are probably illegal, at least in the US. And, uh, but they're French and they don't but care they're French, about that. So they don't care. They just eat cheese. Um, but basically, it's been around for a very long time. And a company called Applidium, which is not associated with the Videoland project, came along and said, we like this project. We're going to port it to the iPhone and make it commercial. Still going to release the source code, but we'll charge a buck for it on the App Store. And they did. It was amazing. It was very popular. And people loved it. Unfortunately, VLC, the original VLC, was licensed under the GPL v2, which is an interesting license. A uh, very popular one, though. Very popular one, though. Mm. Uh, and of course, because of that, they had to license the iTunes version, the App Store version, under the same license, which is correct and the correct thing to do. Uh, but they forgot one thing. What did they forget, Chris? Oh, they forgot that lots and lots and lots of people own the copyright and that they actually have to obey the license that the people who own the copyright apply to their code. So this was a very popular app. It was up for a few months. Lots of people downloaded it. If anyone's still got it, it's great to have because you can play all sorts of stuff your iPhone and iPad can't normally play at the expense of battery life. Um, but shortly into their sort of life cycle of this app being live on the App Store, another Frenchman who contributed code to the Videoland project at some point in the past came along and said, hey, you can't do that. And because they didn't have any sort of copyright assignments from him or anything like that, he basically kicked up a big shitstorm and wrote to Apple and said, this is infringing my copyright. So Apple pulled it down. And everyone on the internet reacted by saying, what the hell is this? This is bullshit, Apple. But really, Apple was not really in the wrong. What happened here was the people who made the VLC client for iPad and iPhone really didn't pay attention to the requirements of the thing they were building. They said, well, we can take this GPL code. It's open source. It's happy. It's hippie. It's free. And we can build a nice app for it. And they did. But because so many people owned the code in that, and they didn't really know what they were doing, they didn't do it properly. So what we're going to do now is take a quick look at licenses to make sure you know what you're doing and don't come into a similar situation where Apple removes your app because some Frenchman complains, or the community just goes nuts in general. Yes, so that was a precautionary tale. Uh, we'll come hopefully, back we can now explain to you how to avoid this sort of thing happening. Which button do I press? This one. This, this one. You may be familiar with Apple technology. They usually have very few buttons. That's why there are like eight of them on this thing. Have you seen another remote lately? My other one had like one that I ever cared about. It's a Wiimote. Oh. Yeah, it is, but you know what? what yeah. That's a joke. No. Just you. Just you, Tim. Anyway, the talk. Yes, uh, we should get on with that, shouldn't we? OK, yeah, there are three broad classes of open source licenses that are out there at the moment. Uh, the first class that you're probably familiar with are the copyleft type licenses, um, generally produced by the Free Software Foundation. And the shining example of that is the general public license. I wouldn't call it shining. Well, it's the one that people turn to by default normally, because that's what there is. Um, then there are BSD style licenses, which are ones that just require you to provide attribution um, to the original authors of a piece of code. And then there are MIT style licenses, which are also very, very similar to BSD licenses. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is the GPL and how it applies to things like the App Store. Um, so the GPL is produced by the Free Software Foundation. Uh, and it basically encapsulates the ideas put forward by Richard Stallman when he uh, wrote the Free Software Manifesto. And it being written by the Free Software Foundation, this means that they have an opinion about it when it comes to things like the App Store. And that's that the Free Software Foundation believes that the GPL is fundamentally incompatible with it. 
And it might be instructive to investigate why this is the case. Um, Richard Stallman set out four, th uh, four freedoms when he explained why uh, free software was a good idea. There is freedom zero, which is the freedom to run the program for any purpose. There is freedom one, which is to study how the program works and to change it to make it do what you want. And a prerequisite for that is to have the source code available. The second is to be able to freely redistribute copies to your neighbor. And the third is to be able to distribute mod um, modified copies of a program. So if you make your own modifications, that you can give those modifications to other people. And the spanner in the works for things like the App Store is Freedom 2, which is the ability to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. So if we dive into the GPL itself, we have a, uh, there's a there's an article about it if you're interested in reading it. Um, there's this big block of text in the middle which looks like that, blah 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 blah. Redistribution automatically licenses things. Um, here's the relevant sentences to it. The recipient automatically receives a license, yada yada yada, to distribute the subject to these terms and conditions. So if you provide a piece of code under the GPL. Somebody who receives that code has to distribute the code under the same license. And furthermore, the person who does receive that code may not impose any further restrictions upon the recipient's exercise, um, exercise of the rights within the license. So that says that if you give the code to somebody else, they may not add extra terms to the license. Um, or restrictions upon distribution. Guess who does that, technically? So this is Apple's terms and conditions, at least it was a month ago. For the users. For the users, you can read it at that URL. It's thrilling. It's one of the best written things ever. No, it's not. Um, but it basically says you can download products for your own personal use for your Apple devices via the App Store. Uh, and it's basically for devices you own or control only. End result, Chris. What is it? Well, the end result is that only Apple can distribute applications that work. Come from Apple. Right? If you want to run an app on an iPhone or an iPad or an iPod Touch, you have to download it from the App Store unless you're doing silly things to your phone. Which means I can't download an app and so, give it to Chris. So, but what this means is that even if you have the source code to, a, to an application, if you do not receive the source code from Apple, Apple are in breach of the GPL. And so what this basically means is that although Apple aren't explicit about their, um, about their terms, or aren't, Apple aren't explicit about licenses applying to code, the GPL itself is. And the GPL says that you can't do this. And Apple like to avoid getting into legal problems. Sometimes. Well, wherever possible, I guess. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's highly unlikely that Apple are going to change their way of conducting business specifically to allow people who distribute code under the GPL to be able to do this easily on the App Store. Um, so the easiest way to satisfy these requirements of Apple is to not go and use code that's released under the GPL. Right. But to instead use code that is licensed under something else, like the MIT or the BSD style licenses. Exactly. Right. Um, and basically, these don't require you to provide the source code uh, alongside an app when you distribute it. It just requires that you provide attribution to the original authors and a couple of other terms that involve um, disclaiming warranties and things like that. Pretty straightforward and pretty friendly stuff. As it turns out, there are quite a few good examples of BSD style licenses being used on the App Store. We're going to take a quick look at now. So this is a fairly popular example. It's called Colloquy. It's an IRC client. It's under a BSD license. It is, in fact, a commercial app on the App Store. I think it costs a dollar. It's a popular IRC client. Um, it's obviously going to be used only by nerds because it's an IRC client. So it's still available. That's, um, the Thank unique you. thing here is that you can grab it from the Colloquy website, and it's fully open source. And it's so if you were stupid enough to want to redistribute Colloquy in an identical form on the App Store, you probably could. So the take-home um, message here is that certain licenses are basically fine to, to distribute on the App Store. 
the terms that you have on these licenses aren't particularly limiting and they're very, very easy to meet if you can be bothered. And you should be bothered because it's the terms under which you get the code and you're getting this for free. Exactly. So what we're going to do is take a look at... Um, stuff in the wild. Stuff in the wild. So right. a study by a group called OpenLogic, uh, which is a little open source researcher group, said that 71% of mobile apps, which includes iPhone and Android, there's no way to break it down, unfortunately, uh, that they scanned with some sort of magical scanning tool, I'm guessing they're looking at what, what it is, but, uh, failed to comply with the licensing obligations of open source software that they were using. So it's highly possible that 71% of apps out there are actually using something that's GPL, BSD, MRT, Apache, whatever, and they're not actually either uh, obeying the copyright law appropriately or crediting the original author of those, those programs. It's kind of sad. So, um, so yeah, take home message to this. If you want to play in Apple's App Store, um, be sensible and, and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do. Um, One question you may have now. You think they have does anybody have a question? Well, sorry, that's the one. Was that it? No. Do you want to ask it anyway? That's a question. <laughs> that's a really good question. Shut up. <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. No, go for it. Uh, Darwin itself is under a BSD license. Yeah. Uh, Z Zlib is under the Zlib license, and Darwin itself is under the BSD license. And the Apple specific components of iOS Apple. are under the, the open source ones of the APSL, which is. Yeah, Apple. App uh, well, things that Apple provide, they're very, 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 very particular about. I mean, they, ha they have lawyers, they do audits. Check in your iPhone settings, you can find the list of all the licenses that you're agreeing to by using your iPhone. There is the GPL in there, but you very rarely link against it. Like it's in the OS, but you don't need to link against it. Anyway. Especially ignore his answer. And we'll yes, talk, I talk think so. Yeah. yeah, let's go. Cool. Okay, so uh, somebody else had a question. Russell. Was, Russell, what was your question? Oh, how many? Amazing. Yeah, that's it's great. We had a slide written here. It's fantastic. Um, okay, so we should think about people's questions more often. Good. Okay. Yes. So great. when you're when you're licensing your own code, um, yeah. if you're the copyright holder, then you yeah. can do a very special thing. Yes. Um, so, if you write your own open source code and you feel like you need to op release things under the GPL, and there are really good reasons for doing that, it's a good way to, um, to lock your contributors into contributing for you, um, which we call fostering a sense of community in the open source world. Um, no, believe me, it works and people really love this. Um, what you do is... I want the remote, thank you. Punching my fist to demonstrate. Yeah, great. And I wanted to grab the remote off you. Um, so what you can do is you can ask for copyright assignments um, if you have other contributors. This is William Shatner asking for copyright assignments. Um, I'm not convinced he'll do that. Um, yeah, so ask for copyright assignment from your contributors. Um, the best way to do this is to make it a requirement of contributing when you start a project but you don't necessarily get the advantages of this if you're just jumping into, if you're deciding you want to release an iPhone port halfway through your, um, halfway through your project's existence. And unfortunately for a project like VLC, which is sort of a mix of spaghetti code that's sort of congealed over the years rather than evolved. Heaps um, and heaps of developers. It's almost impossible to do this all around the world. In the future if you don't do it initially, which is if why they go the shitstorm they did. If your contributors are dead, you can't ask for copyright assignment from them. Um, some people just won't provide copyright assignment. But if you start your own project under the GPL, then you really should ask your contributors for copyright assignment. It's a good idea. Um, and then once you've done that, this means that you can grant specific exemptions for particular ways of distributing your code. So you might say, uh, if Apple is distributing a binary, we will provide a link within our piece of software, our app, um, to the source. So if Apple has provided the binary, then you're providing a way to comply with the GPL and you can say that this is sufficient in writing and you make that the license to your project. Once again, you can really only do this if you're the sole copyright uh, holder or you're starting a project from scratch. 
And you know, there are a couple of examples of GPL projects in the wild that are doing this. Popular one is WordPress for iPhone, which is under a GPL v2. They ask for copyright assignment straight away. They're not the best iPhone app, but they're a good example of a fairly big, well-known project doing this. Um, so troubles in that process. I think Wikipedia also does something similar. And on the gaming side, there's Battle for Wesnoth, which is a long-standing open source project that for whatever reason had the foresight to do this properly, and such they can release on the iPhone. Cool. We're going to take a quick look at GitHub now. Has anyone used GitHub or has used GitHub? Have you used it or just have, do you, have you just used it or do you actually have an account? Good. Cool. So if you're, if you're, a lot of you look old, sorry. Um, <laughs> but if you're, if you're like a university student, then GitHub should really be your resume these days. Um, so or at least point to it in the resume. It's part of your resume. Mm -hmm. So if you're working on iPhone uh, OS, Well, you can say this is a link to source code. They, they do have links where you can like not see the newfangled Gittish stuff. But if you if you're wanting to work in a job or do work in a job or want to get a new job that has code, people are going to want to look at your code. People want jobs. Apparently, I never understood it myself. Oh. Um, people are going to want to look at your code, and it's it's harder to forge code than it is to fill out a bullshit profile on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, so, if you are making things in your spare time, why not commit them to GitHub, and you know document. A little bit. That way, you've sort of got a trace of your online, online of your life as an iPhone programmer, and it's all open source to boot. So if somebody does something interesting with it, you, they can fork it on GitHub, and you can find out what they've done. It's pretty cool. And believe it or not, people actually read your commit logs. Gibberish um, in them like Chris. Oh, wait, what? My commit logs are useful. Damn you. Oh. Anyway, let's look at some useful things. Uh, like yes. Chris. So yes, I'm going to sit down now because I don't develop for iOS and I don't know what Paris is about to talk about. You do. You've seen this before. You liar. All right. This is the the bit of the presentation where we jump through. Thanks, Chris. He's actually going to sit down, isn't he? Hey, Josh. How are you? Okay. Oh, cool. This is the Not bit where bad. we jump through a bunch of useful like bits it. and pieces. Uh, quite in the back row. This is the bit where we jump through a few useful bits and pieces that might make your life as an iPhone programmer a bit easier. Uh, this is the cop out waste of time section of the talk where we tell you about useful open source things that you'd like. Free code tends to make better apps. And usually the best iPhone apps incorporate some free code somewhere or give back in the form of free code. Uh, so everyone should be familiar with pull to refresh. Yeah, pull to refresh is a pretty popular gesture these days. Why not steal it from someone else? One implementation of pull to refresh, there oh, are oh, literally oh, hundreds. Use licensed code, Paris. Steal, that's what I said. Oh. Um, why not steal it from someone else? This is one implementation of it. It's under the BSD license, so you're free to do basically whatever you like. Great. Uh, this one from Gowala, Alamo Fire, uh, networking stack, which is sort of a block-based networking API. If anyone's followed the semi-shitstorm that occurred with the other networking stack recently, this is a good one to move to if you really don't want to use the built-in stuff in IRS5. But again, it's free. It's there for you to use it. I think somebody mentioned this yesterday in one of their talks. Box and NS operation based, so it's pretty cool. It's also Crash Kit, so which basically lets you automatically log your crashes. The point here is there's so much useful stuff and it's all free that you should be giving back in addition to consuming this stuff. MIT license here. SBJSON, probably the most widely used JSON framework. Everything we've ever written that uses JSON on the iPhone uses this. And apps ranging from Twitter to Facebook to God knows what else use this to consume their JSON feeds inside the app. No better endorsement than that, despite how bad the Facebook app has become lately. MB Progress Hub, you know, it's a simple visual enhancement for your app. It's in the middle, MIT. This is made by uh, a guy that does a lot of really cool visual additions you can use. In-app settings kit lets you duplicate the settings screen in your app. I did say this was where we jumped through lots of things, so be patient. Uh, In-app settings screen lets you duplicate the settings screen in your app to basically reproduce the iPhone settings screen. Maybe it's not a good UX decision, but you can do it. It's under the BSD license. There you go. If you need to push content to Twitter or Facebook and you're not using iOS 5 or just want to do more than Twitter, this thing lets you drop in the thing that lets you push content wherever you like, including open to Safari. Um, because Chris loves REST so much, I put this in. Uh, this is, lets you basically talk to a REST API fairly straightforwardly. Uh, it even lets you sync core data with REST as well as switch between development and staging and production servers and things like that. So it's really cool. Check this out if you have one. It's under the Apache license, which we're not really going to talk about, but it's similar enough to BSD and MIT. Doesn't really matter. Fully loaded is a automatic uh, table view image loading system, which just lets you scroll infinitely. Uh, it's pretty cool. 
If you've ever used a Twitter app that's not the official Twitter app, you've probably used this. It's MG Twitter Engine by Matt Legend Gemmel, which is his real name. Um, a couple other people have mentioned him as well, including really awesome. BSD again, 320, I don't really like this, but I put it in here because it's a powerful example of a huge library. Uh, Joe Hewitt, the guy who created this, came out yesterday and said if he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't have made this, so <laughs> please don't use this. But this is a great example of the power of a massive open source library to sort of worm its way through the community. This thing is what powered the original iteration of the Facebook app. So it's all the, the, the network loading tables, all the scrolling views, all the pull to refresh in Facebook, all that stuff. Um, the idea was to bring CSS and sort of browser-based ideas to iPhone development so you could have in-app URLs to navigate to parts of the app and stuff. It's huge, it's powerful, it's open source, please don't use it. <laughs> the one thing to remember here is you don't forget to attribute. Um, you need to refer to BSD code uh, if you use it. A great place to do this is the EULA. You can put a custom EULA on iTunes. So if you really don't want to interfere with the UX of your app, you could theoretically stick it there. That's a decent place to do it. Does anyone know what a scheme is? Scheme? That, that's where we try to convince people that what we're saying is right. No. Oh. no. They can tell. They can see right through it. Um, a scheme is a way to handle a URL inside the app. This is another picture of William Shatner. Uh, you can have an app that responds to an, a URL like ISE colon slash slash and then a bunch of other stuff so apps can launch each other. It's a fairly pitiful way of inter-process or inter-app communication, um, but it does work. If you want to be a decent open app, it's a good idea to support as many other possible apps as you like. If anyone's used the fabulous conference app, you'll notice on the info tab you can tap the dev world hashtag and it will try and launch whatever Twitter client you have installed. It does that through these. So it first tries Twitter for iPhone, then it'll try Tweetbot, then it'll try Twitterific, and then it tries a few others, then it'll eventually just try and launch it in Safari. This is the way it does that. And these sites list open URL standards you can use to make your app feel a bit more like part of a community. Good. And as I said, it's interapp communication, not intra-app communication. That typo has existed for a while. <sighs> okay, if you really want to make your own code under the open source licenses, we've covered a good way to do it is Matt Legend Gemmel's approach. He has a page here on his website, it's worth looking at, where he basically documents a good way of doing it. Uh, his license is basically the BSD license with some British added. Um, and he also makes it available under a commercial license should you work for a megacorp who can't possibly trust the BSD license. We'd always encourage you to open your API library. You don't really have anything to lose. Uh, a great example of an open API library is Localytics. Does anyone use this or has anyone seen this? Does anyone use Flurry? Mods for Flurry. Okay, this is basically an open source clone of Flurry that lets you host the server yourself. So it's fully open source uh, instrumentation analytics for your app. It's really cool and I like this example because They've open sourced their specification as well as their code, and it's all very clear that they're not going to try and screw you over. They've got the legalese to prove it, so check this out. It's good stuff. A few tools if you really want to do open source stuff are PhoneGap. Not really going to cover PhoneGap. I'm sure you've all heard of it or have already heard of it and don't like it. Um, if you want to make a game, Cocos 2D is a great way to make it, despite the fact it's now owned by Zynga. How many people knew it's owned by Zynga? Surprises people. Okay, so it's also open source, so you can exactly. So it doesn't matter. Not from Zynga. It doesn't matter. It's great. MIT license, Cocos 2D, really powerful. If you're a Flash developer, try Sparrow. It's kind of like Cocos 2D, but it looks like uh, ActionScript. It's pretty cool stuff. It's more open source coolness for you. Box 2D. We have a little story about Box 2D. How many people have played Angry Birds? Okay. So, the Zlib license, which is what Box 2D comes under. Box 2D is a 2D physics engine for games. Uh, does not require attribution. But at the, the GDC in San Francisco this year, there was a Q&A uh, with the creator of Angry Birds, who is a very large Finnish man. Um, and somebody stood up and asked what physics engine the Angry Birds uses. And the, the creator said, well, it's Box2D. And uh, the guy said, well, would you consider giving credit to the author of Box2D? And the guy said, yes, of course. And it turns out it was the author. And the Angry Birds guys basically said this afterwards. This isn't meant to be a hugely meaningful story. The point is, you may as well give credit anyway. It's like, these things are really powerful and really enable you to do cool things. Why not credit the people who let you do this? Uh, now, something like 50% of the uh, iPhone 
games that are available these days use this app to build their art, apparently. That's pretty huge. This app's crap if you're used to Illustrator, but it's awesome in that it's free. So check it out. Another example of the power of open source. Now, as we wind up, we have one Xcode tip. It's amazing. Oh, technical things in this talk. No, sorry. Um, don't just drag and drop the folders of libraries you're using into your Xcode project. Xcode actually has a clever way of handling this stuff. If you use uh, separate targets and build static uh, libraries for each third-party open source library you use, uh, you can actually make them sub-projects of your Xcode project and update them independently without having to fork around with the code. So look into Xcode's ability to support sub-projects, especially if you're using something like Git, because then you can update all the sub-projects from the Git repositories, like the things I jumped through earlier, without having to think about how they relate to your project. And your project will always have the latest version of their code. And anything you change in sort of a sub-project that belongs to you, but you might want to open source, can be pushed out independently of your project. So break it up into sub-projects and think about it that way. A few other uh, resources are the open source iPhone directory, which is basically a list of components that you can use, like the ones we went through. And Cocoa Controls, which is similar. Are you jumping through the window? Uh, um, no, I thought that was a wall. And a list of Cocoa Controls, which is a similar thing. And Chris is now going to talk some more. Oh, oh cool. Finally. Finally. Amazing. Um, Apparently, it's the end of the talk. Yeah. Okay, so um, in conclusion, uh, we have somewhat of a trade-off when it comes to trying to work with open source code on iOS applications. Uh, we have this thing that Apple says, which is, you know, if your, applica if your application includes any FOSS, uh, make sure that you don't expose Apple to the terms of the license. And then we have the general public license, or the GPL, and that says you may not impose any further restrictions on the recipient's rights. Um, and so these things in combination, uh, I can only really say one thing to it, and that is to be careful. Make sure that you're doing what your license tells you to do, and make sure that you make sure that when your users have your application, uh, they're not in breach of the license under which you obtain the code. So there are two ways to go about fixing this or dealing with it. The first is that if you're going to take, if you're going to write your own project and you really want to do it under the GPL, make sure that there is a second license available. This really only needs to be the GPL plus a few extra exemptions to make sure that you can distribute via the App Store. It's really small, you can do it in one paragraph. Um, alternatively, release under the BSD or MIT licenses. Um, these are really popular in the iOS community and you have very little to lose from getting them other than somewhere you're stealing all your code and never contributing back. But, you know, that's a risk you can take. Um, finally, we're not lawyers, don't sue us. This is not legal advice. And that is the end of the talk. Uh, we have a feedback link down the bottom. Please give us some feedback. 